In this video, we're going into more detail about electron configurations. We're learning about subshells. So the key learning tension is that electron shells are actually divided into subshells, which overlap in energies. And you can write an electron configuration using this new method called subshell notation. So you should be able to define subshells, list the names and the maximum number that each subshell can contain of electrons, um, interpret a subshell configuration when you see it written down, and be able to write subshell configurations for the first 38 elements. So let's review electron shell filling when we first learnt electron configurations. So remember, each electron shell can only contain a maximum number of electrons, and there's a simple math formula to remember that. An easy way to remember that formula is that we're doubling the square numbers. So the first shell can contain double one squared. So one squared is one, double it and you get two. Well, the next square number is two. So, sorry, four is the next square number. So the second shell can hold double that, which is eight. The third shell can hold double the next square number, which is nine. And the fourth shell can hold double 16. So you remember the square numbers and you double it. And that's the easy way to remember the maximum number of electrons per shell. So actually, as scientists were discovering parts of the atom, they realized that each electron shell is actually separated into smaller subshells. So this diagram here, you can see here's the first shell, the second shell, the third shell, the fourth, and so on. And actually, each of those shells, you can see with the lines, is split up into even smaller subshells. Although the first shell only has one subshell. Each of those subshells can only hold a particular maximum number of electrons as well. And we'll learn that pattern next. So here are the subshells that scientists named. There's four subshells that are important. And scientists named them S, P, D, and F, beginning from closest to the atom, as always. Sorry, closest to the nucleus. So if we have four subshells that we're looking at, then the closest to the nucleus would be S, and then we go out from there. The maximum number of electrons that they can each hold in these subshells is two for an S subshell, six for P, 10 for D, and 14 for F. And you can see that's a pretty simple number pattern. We're increasing by four each time, beginning with two in the S subshell. So let's look at how many electrons can fit in each shell compared to the subshells inside it and how they relate to each other. So each shell contains an increasing number of subshells. So you can see the first shell only has one subshell and the first subshell is always S. The second shell has two subshells, the third has three and the fourth has four. And we always start with S. So the first shell has only an S subshell. The subshells are like the building blocks that make up the shell. Then the second shell, it has two subshells. So we're going to start with an S again. And it also has a P subshell. And then the third shell, it has an S and a P and a D subshell. And the fourth has S, P, D and F. The number in front of the subshell just tells us which shell that subshell is a part of. So this 1s here means we're an s subshell in the first shell. And this 4d down here means we're in the fourth shell and it's a 4d subshell.
on top of that, then we can think about, okay, how do the subshells relate to how many electrons can fit in each shell? So we've already learnt how many electrons can fit in each shell. The first can hold two, the second holds eight, then 18, and then 32. Well, we get to those numbers by adding each of the subshell maximums together. So remember that an S subshell can hold only two, and that's why the first shell holds two. If you look at the second shell though, remember an S subshell can hold two, but a P subshell can hold six. Add those two together, and that's why the second shell can hold eight in total. For the third shell, we've got two in the S, six in the P, and 10 in the D. Two plus six plus 10 is 18. So the third shell can hold 18 in total because it's made up of an S, a P, and a D subshell. All right. The next thing to be able to do is to write the electron configuration, but using the subshells that we've just learned. And we can do that using these subshell configurations here. So as we've already learned, the number at the front is telling us the shell number. The letter tells us which subshell we're looking at. And the number to the top right tells us the number of electrons in that subshell. Okay, these symbols look like maths. That looks like a squared in maths. But forget all of your maths operations. This is just writing the number of electrons. So there's no maths involved here. Okay, let's look at each of these elements and how to write their electron configurations, but using the subshell configuration. So hydrogen is element number one, so it only has one electron, which means it's going to have it in the first shell. The first shell only has an S subshell, and there's only going to be one electron. So that's the electron configuration for hydrogen. Beryllium is element number four, atomic number four. So it's going to have in its first shell its S subshell is going to be full, so it's going to have two. And, but remember, beryllium's electron configuration is two, two. So that means there's a second shell that has two electrons. So we're going to need a second shell. The first subshell is always S and then it will have two electrons in that S. All right, oxygen is next. Its electron configuration is two, six, because its atomic number is eight. So it's gonna have two electrons in the one S subshell. It's then gonna have two electrons in the two S subshell because S is the first subshell. But now we're going to need to fill up the next subshell, which is the two P. So we've already got four electrons, so the 2p is going to have those extra four. All right, sodium next is number 11. Its normal electron configuration is 2, 8, 1. So we know we've got three shells. So it's going to have its 1s full, its 2s is full, its 2p is also full, remember 2p any P subshell can only hold six. So we're up to 10. We need to get one more electron. So that's going to have to be added in the third shell. And S is always the first subshell. So there's our extra one. Phosphorus, element 15, is going to be 2, 8, 5. For its electron configuration, let's write the subshell configuration. First shell. Second shell has eight, two plus six. The third shell, well, the three S is full. It can only hold two. Now we need to add three more. So they're going to be in the three P subshell. And that gets us to 15. Calcium number 20 is two, eight, eight in the third shell and 
Remember, the outer shell can't have more than eight, so calcium has to have a fourth shell, which has the extra two. So calcium will have the first shell full, the two S is full, the two P is full, three S is full, the three P is also full, so we're up to 18. And then we have those extra two that we need to add, and they'll be in the fourth shell, beginning with the 4S subshell. All right. So that's how you work out the subshell configurations for the first 20 elements, and that's ignoring the backfilling, which we did learn earlier. Let's learn how to do subshell configurations beyond number 20, which includes backfilling. So the reason that backfilling happens, remember it happens in the transition metals, is because of this graph here. So this graph shows us the energy levels of each shell and each subshell. And the important part is here. So the 4S subshell actually has a lower energy than the 3D subshell. So electrons are going to fill up the 4S before they fill the 3D. And then once the 4S is full, like it was in calcium, then we start to backfill into the 3D subshell. And that's what happens in all the transition metals. There's also another way, again, using the periodic table to help you remember a lot of these rules. And it's the idea of blocks in the periodic table. So group one and two on the left here, we call those the S block. And that's because in these elements, the last electron is filling the S subshell. So remember something like sodium, it has the electron configuration 281. So that last electron, that number one, is filling the 3S subshell. Over on the right, we call the P block because all those elements, their last electron is filling up in the P subshell of whichever shell we're at. The transition metals are called the D block and they're the ones that are backfilling and it's always the D subshell that's backfilling. And then if you get far enough down, remember the F block fits in here. Down in these elements, they're backfilling the F subshell from the earlier shell. We won't get that far though. Also don't forget that the period, the row that we're in, tells us how many shells that those, elect that those atoms have. The row you're in, the period you're in, tells you the number of shells. There's also another really useful diagram called a subshell filling diagram and it helps us to know which subshells to fill in which order. So for this year in year 10, we'll give you this one for any questions that are relevant. And it's a shortcut. So the way you use it is you follow the snake of the arrows. So when you're filling up subshells, firstly you fill the 1S, then you follow the snake around, then you fill the 2S, follow it around, then you fill the 2P, then the 3S, follow it around, then you fill the 3P, then you fill the 4S, and then we come back and this is where backfilling starts. Because the 3D fills up again, and then once the 3D is full, then we continue with the 4P, then we get to the 5S, and then the 4D backfills, and then it continues on and on and off. So the subshelling filling diagram is really useful.